Okay, we are going to start. Okay. Um, hello and greetings um, to everyone who is participating in this side event on protecting the environment is protecting civilians. I am um, Dr. Erica Weinthal. I'm a professor at Duke University at the Nicholas School of the Environment, and I am also the vice president of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association. Um, I want to begin by noting that this is an event that builds on um, an event that took place last year um, during POC week that looked at the links between the protection of the environment and civilians. And today we're going to be taking a deeper dive into um, the particular impacts related to um, the links between the environment and protecting civilians. I want to um, acknowledge our co-hosts for this event. They include the governments of Belgium, Costa Rica, Niger, Switzerland, and Vietnam, along with um, other partners, the joint UNEP OSHA Environment Unit, the Environmental Peacebuilding Association, and PACS. What I wanna do next um, is run through um, the agenda. Okay. We are, um, we're gonna keep to a very tight schedule today. So um, we will move very quickly, but we will start with opening remarks from Ambassador Dong, from, um, who is also from the, the permanent representative of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to the UN. And then Mr. Aougi, um, who is a minister and, dep and deputy permanent rep representative of Niger to the UN. And then after that, we will move to a, pan, a panel that will look at um, these various impacts related to um, protecting the environment as a mechanism for protecting civilians, civilians um, looking at um, humanitarian um, operations and issues such as food security. Um, and our panelists include um, Ms. Johanna um, Bretu Klein, from the London School of Economics. Um, Mr. Chris Harland from the International Committee of the Red Cross um, in New York. Um, Mr. Dominique Deval um, from the World Bank. And Mr. Wim um, Venenberg from PAX. And then we will have closing remarks at the end from Ambassador Kridelka from um, the, um, permanent, the permanent representative of Belgium to the UN. And with that, I'm going to turn it over for our first set of opening remarks to Ambassador Dong. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today and for your interest in this topic. The environment is widely considered as a common public good. Protecting the environment is a moral and legal obligation upon all of us, both in time of peace and in time of war. It is also a responsibility of a human to itself and to the future generation. In peacetime, the environment is already being de degraded and in armed conflict, biodiversity, air, water, land, and soil take a heavy toll. Environmental infrastructure are subject to indicators indiscriminate attacks and destruction, including as a method of warfare. The once environment fails to support human subsistence, it can trigger or worsen forced displacement and increase the threats to conflict-induced food insecurity and risk of public health services. And the panelists will develop upon the consequences of environmental destruction can be felt long after the conflict has ended and in post-conflict environmental restoration and rehabilitation is no less important in sustaining human life and enabling faster recover recovery from the consequences of wars and building peace. We we'll learn firsthand the environmental con consequences of armed conflict. You know that the war ended in Vietnam for more than 45 years ago, but the massive area, the hundreds of thousands of acres remain contaminated and about 3 million Vietnamese people have since suffered from severe health problems due to exposure to the dioxide of uh, 
is in origin. It will take a long time and great associates and efforts to address this legal seat. But we highly appreciate the assistance of bilateral partner and United Nations Agency and the international community. We believe that the protection of the natural environment is closely intertwined with the protection of civilians. It should be integrated as part of a comprehensive approach to protection of civilian and building peace. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed and exacerbated existing fragilities of the country in armed conflict. There is a strong imperative to pay heel to environmental degradation, a silent casualty of armed conflict. And we welcome further discussion on measures along these lines, including monitoring analyzing and preventive measures. During Vietnam presidency last month, the Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 2573 on the protection of objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population and essential service such as water and sanitation. The Council unity reflects its strong commitment to upholding international humanitarian law. It is hopeful that Resolution 2573 will create the momentum for further incentive to address the direct and indirect impact of armed conflict on civilians. Finally, allow me to express my sincere appreciation for the fellow co-hosts for convening this meaningful event and to all panelists for your dedication to the topic. I wish you a fruitful discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Dong, and thank you for highlighting um, the long-term environmental consequences of war. Um, we are now going to turn it over to Mr. Aoubi, um, who is the Deputy Permanent Represent Representative of Niger to the UN. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we express our gratitude to the joint uh, UNPOCHA Environment Ital Unit, Environmental Peace Building Association, and PACS for convening this side event to the annual UNC debate on the protection of civilians. We would also like to thank Belgium, Costa Rica, Switzerland, and Vietnam for their co sponsoring. As we embark on the week of protection of civilians, and on the wheels of the annual POC debate in the Council, it's good to acknowledge that when we talk about protection of civilians, we must also talk about the protection of environment and examine the determinantal impact of conflict, related environmental damage on civilians, while exploring the linkage between protecting the environment and protecting civilians in armed conflict. Historically speaking, and when we look at the current landscape, we see how armed conflict may have a negative impact on the natural environment and cause severe and long-lasting consequences, both to the nature and to the population that depend on natural resources for their survival. And while this is a frequent occurrence, the protection of the environment is more often than not put on the back burner of parties to the conflict. When environmental degradation also collides with climate risk, it's compound the challenges for the population, especially in regions such as the Sahel, where we have asymmetrical warfare nowadays. One of our signature events last year highlighted that relationship and this is why during our current term as elected member of the council, we have championed not only the inclusion and dissemination of IHL rules when it's come to protecting the environment during armed conflict, but also encourage the promotion of coordinated effort between government and humanitarian actors in hope of mitigating those harmful effects and further protecting civilians. I believe that today's conversation is timely and encourage all present to engage and help move the discussion further. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aoki. Um, and thank you for those comments on how 
important it is for um, really thinking about the environment as um, essential for protecting civilians given how civilians depend on natural resources so much for their livelihood. And this is a perfect segue um, into our panel. And I'm gonna start with some housekeeping rules just to get us started. Um, we're gonna ask that everyone keeps their microphones off. They should be muted already. Um, and you are welcome to communicate with the organizers at any time via Zoom. Um, you can send your questions um, that we will hopefully get to at the end. And um, again, you know, submit them via the Q&A function. And that this event is being recorded and will be posted online um, afterwards. So you can look for the event um, to just to watch it again. Um, and with that, I am gonna turn it over um, to our panel discussion. And I'm gonna ask that every, all the panelists stay within um, 10 minutes, um, just so that we can have an opportunity for some Q&A at the end. And so we're gonna start again uh, with Ms. Johanna um, Bretto Klein uh, from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Hi everyone. Um, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Johanna. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and I'm here to present on behalf of my group our research on protecting lives, livelihoods, and the environment in humanitarian operations. This research was commissioned by the Joint Environment Unit of UNEP and OCHA as part of LSE's um, the consultancy project. Next slide, please. So on today's agenda, I will firstly briefly present with an introduction to both our topic and our research. We'll then look at deconstructing environmental dynamics in protection programming. We'll then look at how to address environmental harm to humanitarian protection. And finally, I will present some recommendations and key takeaways from our study. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so in prioritizing humanitarian relief, protection operations tend to see the environment as a development issue. And as such, the environment is often seen as an invisible issue. There also exists a gap in the literature on how to effectively integrate the environment in humanitarian operations. This research aims to contribute to fulfilling this gap. Our research focused on, uh, yeah, next slide, thank you. Uh, our research focused on analyzing the nexus between the protection of civilians and the protection of the environment in protected crisis. And we, to do so, we used a mixed method combining um, survey analysis, interviews, and literature review. We aim to answer three main research questions, that of what kind of environmental situations or dynamics affect civilian protection operations, how can the humanitarian system better address environmental dynamics of conflicts to reduce protection risks? And finally, how can the links between sustainable environmental management and civilian protection be better addressed in best practice guidance? Next slide, please, thank you. So our second chapter framed the environmental dynamics that shape protected crisis. So um, the environment is directly protected through a number of legal provisions. For example, the ICRC prohibits warfare methods which cause widespread, long-term, and severe damage to the natural environment. However, in spite of legal protections, the environment is often targeted during conflict. Next slide, please. Thank you. There are several different ways in which the environment is impacted by conflict. All of our interviewees communicated that the environment is seen as a development issue to be addressed after reconstruction and stabilization has been achieved. Environmental issues are generally overlooked as they are not a humanitarian priority. For example, here you can read an extract from the interviews describing this tendency. Let's say the people first, and then we'll worry about the environment. This tendency separates the protections of civilians from the protection of the environment and treats them as two separate things. However, and this is a key message, the environment and civilian protections are inseparable. As commented by one of our interviewees, these are two sides of the same coin and you can't really do one without the other. Next slide, please. Thank you. Another important point is that addressing the links between civilian protection and the environment is complex and contextually dependent. When asked about the most critical issues in the nexus between environmental risks and protection of civilians, interviewees consistently focus on complexity and context as a recurring term. In order to protect civilians efficiently, it is important to avoid generalizations and oversimplifications. 
For example, environmental damage during conflict has different impacts on populations in urban and rural areas. This is why protection activities need to, need to avoid rendering technical and more complex and more complex and socially rooted issues and need to acknowledge the dynamic relationship between rural and urban areas, but also the differences between rural, rural and urban people. Next slide, please. Thank you. As previously mentioned, civilians in conflict affected areas are impacted both by direct and indirect environmental harm that increase vulnerabilities. It is possible to define two categories of environmental harm affecting civilians during conflict. The first refers to physical damage caused directly by conflict that manifests in the short term. You can see some example on the slide. The second category refers to the indirect impacts of conflict on the environment, and these usually manifest over the long term. Examples include the collapse of environmental governance, local institutions, and public services. Next slide, please. However, this categorization of environmental harms would be incomplete without accounting for exog exogenous variables such as climate change and COVID-19. These external factors need to be considered for the fact that they exacerbate the effects of direct and indirect environmental damage caused by conflict. For example, climate change accelerates the depletion of natural resources, deforestation, and desertification. Similarly, COVID-19 has increased vulnerability for at-risk populations. Next slide, please. Um, the last part of our second chapter operated a literature review of existing guidance and tools available for the protection of civilians from direct and indirect harm. Practitioners participating in the study convey the feeling of being overwhelmed by existing best practice tools. This means that there is a large amount of guidance material, but at the same time limited application due to the lack of awareness of available tools, the lack of training and exposure to them. Next slide, please. Thank you. Chapter three of our report focused on addressing environmental harm to humanitarian protection. Firstly, in terms of the results of a data collection process, the cluster system and institutional constraints were highlighted by participants as a barrier to the holistic and systematic integration of the environment within protection practice. This was evident through an analysis of the humanitarian needs of review. When examining this assessment, it was clear that the protection environment nexus is not accounted for from the earlier stages of operation planning, as the NHO template only provides limited reference to environmental dimensions of humanitarian needs. And this was a noticeable gap picked up in our analysis. Similarly, interview participants also noted institutional barriers, highlighting how the environment is not effectively integrated into protection practice, and instead the siring of issues has resulted in a lack of recognition for the nexus between civilian protection and environmental harm. Next slide, please. Thank you. The next section focused on the importance of involving communities within the process of addressing environmental harm. And the role of data collection was a strong theme evolving from academic, great literature, and interviews. Data collection has the potential to improve the responsiveness and effectiveness of protection activities, and participants emphasize the need for data-driven decision-making so the environment is no longer an invisible issue. I think an important caveat to this is recognizing how local communities can become involved within this process in terms of context-specific data collection and doing this through channels which enabled affected communities to take ownership of these issues. One participant highlighted the role of citizen science in opposition to technocratic forms of data collection and research. Next slide, please. Thank you. Secondly, with regards to livelihoods of conflict-affected populations, the role of coping strategies and how this impacts the environment and conflict became increasingly apparent. As illustrated by the survey results, livelihoods and labor are greatly impacted by conflict and can lead to a force of a reliance on environmental safety nets. Um, next slide, please. Engaging communities and IDPs to understand environmental coping strategies was chosen as one of the most effective strategies to limit environmental harm and is an area the protection sector needs to more, work more closely in. Next slide, please. In terms of, in terms of specific protection, protection risks, participants highlighted the gender nature of coping strategies, such that one participant gave the example of refugees going to collect firewood and then being attacked in the, protest, in the forest because they weren't supposed to be there, and it was mainly women carrying out these tasks. Recognizing how gender-based violence is used to assert control across environmental contexts is imperative for the protection of civilians. Next slide, please. Thank you. The final theme of this section focused on the importance of building resilience within conflict-affected communities, particularly in the context of climate change and COVID-19. 
It was noticeable from the data collection that indirect harm and resilience building can be missed in protection operations, as there is a divide between humanitarian and development issue. There is a need for climate resilience, for example, to be integrated within protection operations through bottom-up approaches. Particularly at the structural level, the example of Yemen's waste management crisis clearly illustrates the loss of environmental governance capacities during conflict situations. With regards to international humanitarian law, resilience being viewed as a pre-shock intervention rather than long-term issue will aid in effective protection programming. Next slide, please. And then the slide as well. Thank you. Our research looked at many different topics, of which some, some you can find summed up in this slide, which led into our recommendations. Next slide, please. We aimed our recommendations to be pragmatic and actionable, which is why we targeted them at specific entities with different mandates, being protection cluster leads, donors and governments, and humanitarian actors. We grouped our recommendations into three main topics, being that, that of mainstreaming the environment in operational planning, strengthening and adapting existing frameworks, and addressing environmental vulnerabilities and resilience in conflict-affected communities. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, as you can find the full set of recommendations in our report, I'm going to sum up some of our main findings here. With regards to mainstreaming the environment in operation planning, the protection sector needs to focus on integrating the environment into the HPC. There also needs to be improved training and support to staff on environmental assessments, such as the EIA, EMP, and REA. Efforts and funding must also be directed towards improving the data collection and monitoring processes. In order to address environmental vulnerabilities and resilience in conflict-affected communities, there needs to be increasing engagement with communities in participatory approaches, especially with regard to livelihoods, as well as an emphasis is needed to ensure structural resilience building. Finally, in order to strengthen and adapt existing frameworks, there needs to be additional guidance and training for existing tools, as well as an increasing use of international humanitarian law and, a prom and, and promotion of awareness with regard to the protection conflict environment nexus. Next slide, please. I would like to thank you all for your time, and if you have any additional questions, I'd be happy to answer them during the Q&A. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on to our um, next panelist, who is Mr. Chris Harland, um, the Deputy Head of the International Committee of the Red Cross Delegation in New York. Thank you very much, uh, Erica. Uh, today's armed conflicts largely take place at the center of our global environmental and climate crisis. <clears throat> we know that according to UNEP, at least 40% of non-international armed conflicts from 1950 to 2009 were related to natural resources. And that of the 25 countries that are most vulnerable to climate change and least ready to adapt, 14 um, have seen armed conflict. Um, I, I plan to touch on three areas. First, the link between the protection of the natural environment and the protection of civilians. Second, how IHL protects the natural environment, including new guidelines that we've released. And third, what can be done to strengthen this protection? So on to the first point, which I think is actually probably the key point to bear in mind and to take with you after this presentation. And that is that by protecting the environment in armed conflict, we protect civilians. Let me say that again, by protecting the, uh, the environment in armed conflict, we protect civilians. Too often, the natural environment is directly attacked or incidentally damaged by the means and methods of warfare, how we carry out, how states and non-state armed groups carry out armed conflict. And it's further impacted by damage and destruction to the built environment. We see water, soil, land contamination, rending drinking water and agricultural land more scarce and biodiversity irreparably degraded. So the consequences of this damage for the civilian population are many, they are severe and they are complex. Civilians depend on the environment for food and water. Farmers, herders and fishing communities depend on it for livelihoods. When the environment is destroyed and food and economic insecurity intensifies, the physical and mental health of conflict-affected populations deteriorate. 
Their capacity to adapt constricts as conflict and environmental degradation continue. Climate risks, when combined with armed conflict and environmental degradation, make matters worse. Countries in situations of armed conflict are disproportionately impacted by climate variability and extremes. This is in part because of their geography, but mostly because conflicts and their consequences limit the adaptive capacity of people, systems, and institutions. But when environmental degradation collides with climate shocks, food and economic insecurity and health disparities are exacerbated at the same time as the capacity of governments, institutions, and societies to provide support is weakened. So what does the law of armed conflict, it was, as was mentioned in the previous, uh, by the previous panelists, what does IHL say and what, how can that be used if used properly to better protect civilians in armed conflict through the protection of the environment? Well, the first thing to say maybe at the outset is we see renewed momentum to ensure that the environment is adequately protected in war. So for example, the Security Council has held two area formula meetings on the topic in 2018 and 2019. The, the UN Secretary General's annual, annual protection of civilian reports in 2020 and 21 now addresses the civilian suffering compounded by environmental impacts of conflict and climate change. Then third, there are efforts underway to define an international crime of ecocide. Fourth, of critical significance, the UN um, uh, International Law Commission's draft principles on protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts which was adopted on first reading in 2019, are open for comment and the commission will conclude its work in 2022. And fifth, um, from our perspective, we highlight in September of last year, our release of our updated guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflict. And we set out 32 rules and recommendations relating to the protection. Now to be clear, IHL doesn't address all of the protection consequences of armed conflict but it does contain rules that provide protection to the environment and that seek to limit the damage caused to it. We were first asked to do this um, in, we produced it in 1994, so about 30 years ago, following the environmental devastation caused by the spilling of oil and the burning of it in the Gulf War. 30 years later, out, the ICRC is still working with people whose lives have been derailed by conflict-related environmental damage. Today, their hardships are compounded by rapidly intensifying climate crisis. The combined impacts of conflict, environmental degradation, and climate risks have added new urgency to our work to protect the environment, and hence the guidelines. Um, they cover a number of areas, for example, weapons law, how the rules governing the conduct of hostilities apply to the natural environment, and, and this is a key element, the environment is civilian in character. And because it's civilian, it gets a lot of protections. Many people will jump to the special rules in the additional protocols, Articles 35 um, and 55 of Additional Protocol 1, for example, or um, uh, Rule 45 of our customary law study. But, and, and all of that is great. But I want to concentrate on just the very, very basic rules of protecting civilians and civilian objects, because we think sometimes that has been overlooked in armed conflict. By virtue of its civilian character, the natural environment is protected by IHL rules governing the conduct of hostilities. One example of that, proportionality. Disproportionate environmental damage is prohibited under the law of war. So legal discussions relating to the environment, as I say, tend to be drawn towards the special rules, but in rules five to eight of our guidelines, we uh, go into some detail about how the basic rules of IHL apply. And one I wanna to stress today is proportionality. Um, it's not always been evident, um, partly because it's been so hard for uh, those who conduct war, military commanders, to determine, well, how do I balance on the one hand uh, expected uh, military advantage or anticipated military advantage with expected incidental loss, including to the environment. How do I do that? Well, what's I think really exciting, and here's what I would say, if you know someone who is a researcher or who wants to do a bit more um, work that has maybe a, a, a really big impact on how wars are fought in the future, study environmental effects of armed conflict, publish your results, 
that can inform how we and others have dialogue with the military about thinking before you design operations and the impact that they're likely to have on the natural environment and as a result on the civilian uh, population. Uh, so we've seen recent uh, new uh, publications on that and we would simply encourage it. So what are some of those areas? Well, you have to take into account an attack's indirect effects on the natural environment. Um, and more is becoming foreseeable. So the test is foreseeability. If it's foreseeable that what you are doing will have environmental harm, you should take it into account. Now, it doesn't always mean you don't uh, carry out the attack. In many cases, you will, but you need to bear it in mind. You have to also look at the weight given to various types of incidental civilian damage. So, for example, damage to the natural environment in the middle of an uninhabited desert will, of course, carry much less weight than damage to a natural water reservoir used by villagers for drinking or irrigation. And one example of a disproportionate uh, use uh, of an attack relating to damage to the environment would be the burning of an entire forest to eliminate a single small enemy camp of minor importance. Just one example, but more needs to be done in this area. Secondly, we think parties to a conflict should endeavor to conclude agreements which would provide additional protection. And one way to do that is by demarcating demilitarized zones. So the parties can agree, and we are often an intermediary, to say this zone, because of its environmental importance, is off limits uh, to this attack. The parties agree to that. And recommendation 17 goes into, in, in the guidelines, goes into some uh, detail about it. Third, I want to say that uh, we some, it's sometimes overlooked. Non-state armed groups have a range of IHL obligations addressing the protection of the natural environment. We didn't address it in 1994, but we do in 2020. And more than half of the 32 rules and recommendations apply in non-international armed conflict with armed groups. And so we sometimes work with armed groups to try to make sure that they respect in their rules, the rules of armed conflict relating to the protection of the natural environment. Finally, measures to strengthen protection. So it's not enough that they exist on paper. You must do things with them. What do we recommend? First, disseminate the rules. Uh, reflect them in the, uh, on armed forces doctrine, education, training, and discipline. Second, adapt measures to increase the understanding of the effects of armed conflict. For example, mapping areas as to their environmental fragility prior to operations. Third, identify and designate areas of particular environmental importance or fragility as demilitarized zones, as I said, and agree uh, with the parties on that. And finally, exchange examples uh, and good practices of measures that can be taken to comply uh, with IHL obligations. So in closing, the ICRC's guidelines do not address all environmental impacts of conflict, but IHL does place limits on permissible environmental damage for warring parties. It's therefore one contribution among many others, uh, critical efforts that are being led by states, national societies, actors like UNEP, the World Bank and PACS with us today to address the existential threat our planet faces. We all have a part to play. Um, and we're hearing that of course from the other panelists and I would close with cooperation is key. I thank you very much and thank you, Erica. Thank you, Chris, especially for um, sharing um, the ICRC guidelines because this is, you know, we've all been waiting for them for a number of years so it's great to see the icrc really emphasizing these links between protecting environment and protecting civilians um and with that i'm going to turn it over to um dominique duval from the world bank um and i will let you start your slides thank you very much erica and uh, i want to emphasize before i start that this was a, a joint piece of work done by ICRC with UNICEF and the World Bank, and that its focus is very much on uh, MENA and quite a lot on urban, and it's on water and sanitation. That of course, that's a service provided by the environment and also that impacts the environment. Next slide, please. And the, the first thing I want to do is to try and draw a line from the uh, development um, so now the, the development context uh, that, that has led up to um, a lot of the issues in uh, the Middle East in the water sector, and then the, the crisis that 
a lot of water and sanitation providers find themselves in now. And then to, to try and um, understand what is possible or what could have been done differently, both prior to the crisis and um, during the crisis. So the, the key thing, the key first point is that a lot of the development activity that went prior to uh, the 2011 um, uprisings was really a very, very rapid expansion of infrastructure in water and sanitation, but that lacked the emphasis on services and rather emphasized the infrastructure side of it. Now, what, what then happened, of course, is that there was very widespread displacement. And the issue then is now in protracted crisis, what really, what maneuverability do you have as humanitarian or development actors? So that, that was sort of the, 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 the framing of this. Next slide. To really understand this, we <clears throat> brought a, a group of practitioners um, from all over the Middle East and from a number of different organizations together a few years ago now to really try and unpick this basic idea that I'm presenting here, which is that in fact, there's the old problem of rapidly growing urban populations, low cost recovery, uh, increasing water scarcity on the one hand, and then the new problem, the crisis itself, the destruction of infrastructure, the mass movements of people, uh, the tensions between um, host and migrant, et cetera. And what we really need to think about then in the response is how do we deal with both problems at once? Next slide. And being practitioners, we came up with five really very practical problems. The first one is squarely in the environment, is the inadequately governed water resources. The second one is that is around the alternative or even aggressive competition that we saw public water services had from alternative uh, providers. And uh, uh, I'll get into these in, you know, I'll go one by one in a minute. But the idea here is really that uh, the state or the public provision is losing market share to something else. We look at the paralysis of high tech facilities, wastewater treatment plants and desal facilities. And we asked ourselves about the escalating energy costs faced and the cash crunch that is, that is faced by utilities in crisis. Now, there was, some, there was, there was an honesty to the discussion uh, that I think came about with these practitioners. And that was really pre-crisis, we should be looking much harder at the vulnerabilities. And development actors actually need to take a lot more responsibility for the context that they're, uh, that they're setting up in these countries working with governments. Within crisis, managing the service uh, within crisis, there is really, really constrained space to do anything. But what we can do is to try and learn what we could have done before and perhaps pick up some lessons of how to stem that decline. So you see, we're really lowering the bar here, but being very pragmatic. So let me just dip quickly into each of these five things, just very briefly. Next slide, please. So on the, on the um, this key question of water resources management, pre-crisis, there are often ignored signs of water scarcity and quality, uh, whether it's in, in Gaza that we've known that there's increasing salinity or in, in Iraq where we, we've, we know that salinity is increasing um, the further down the Euphrates and Tigris you go. There, there wasn't enough um, analysis and uh, really response to these questions of uh, these signs, these clear signs of water scarcity and quality, quality deterioration beforehand. So we think that how to stem what should have been done before is there should have been a mu much greater effort to publish data on these uh, these growing crises on water resources management 
And I say published data because it's hopeless to expect that um, data will be collected, even data that we've collected from five years ago, I'd, be, I'd have trouble finding. But if we published a paper on it, and it's in the scientific, in a, in a journal somewhere, then it's easy to go to. And we've done that, for example, in Liberia and, and, uh, and, uh, and Sierra Leone recently. Next slide. This, this, uh, this is another uh, sign that I was talking about. The, this, for example, in Syria, the tankers were already increasing, the use of tanker water supplies were already increasing and visible in the record um, from, from 1995 onwards. So the question is, what, what should have been done? How could, how could um, what, su what support could have been done to try and, and fix these resiliency issues uh, prior to that? But this, this sign, this vulnerability is very clear um, around the, the switch between public supply and alternative supplies. And of course, we've seen that in many other um, contexts as well. Now, in terms of figuring out how to stem decline, the regulation of alternative providers pre-crisis is one thing can be, that can be done. But within crisis, uh, UNICEF were quite uh, active in figuring out an exit strategy. Next slide. The, 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 this is a classic. I mean, building high-tech wastewater treatment plants in places which are very vulnerable um, to, to crises is something that we've we've seen in many countries, and it, you don't have to you don't have to look very far to tell that these these wastewater treatment plants aren't working that well even before big crises happen, and so we encourage uh, much more thinking by development partners um, prior to the crisis about what sorts of technology they're going to bring in. And I think here there's a, a an interesting contrast between say the ICRC approach in Rafa. And, and the, uh, the NGEST uh, plant in, in North Gaza. Next slide. On energy costs, all of the utility managers said that during crisis, immediately, all of that subsidy that they used to receive, whether it was subsidy in terms of cheap energy or the government paying their energy bills for them, disappears. Uh, and so again, development partners need to think much more about pre-crisis, what is the energy situation, uh, what are the subsidies, look at the, 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 the type of hidden subsidies that there are in the system, and help to diversify the sources of energy production prior to the crisis. And then within the crisis, as, as UNICEF are doing in, in Yemen at the moment, yes, there is something you can do with, for example, uh, photovoltaic cells, etc. Next slide. So this cash crunch that happens, um, again, if we had uh, better account information, uh, uh, better financial statements from partners across, uh, from utilities across the world, we'd be able to see these vulnerabilities much better up front. Next, next slide. In fact, let's go to the last one and I'll sum up. So the recommendations here is that the hard work to build resilience really has to be done in, in, in advance of crises. And that's somewhat counterintuitive and, and maybe it's annoying uh, for people to, to hear that, but it is also an admission by a development partner here that we really do have to do more to, to, build, to do this, to, to make sure that resilience is built prior to the crisis because within the crisis, there's so much less that you can do. Um, the central, uh, the, the, in terms of what can be done then, development and humanitarian actors really just need to play their parts better. Uh, that's the first aspect, to take greater responsibility for building resilience prior to crisis, but then humanitarians within crisis to take a more development orientated uh, approach to the intervention um, and to have genuine field based partnerships. This is something which I think really there is a lot of scope to, to improve on. And finally, um, that humanitarian development actors also just need to join forces, both to anticipate and respond to the protracted crisis. And what that means is that development actors should really bring humanitarian actors in and their, their all hazards approach into the development way of thinking. 
and equally humanitarian actors can be brought in by development actors uh, to understand the institution building in the early phase recovery. And we feel that these, uh, could, these, these ideas could help uh, be a precaution to better protect uh, the water and sanitation services from collapse. Thank you. Back to you, Erica. Thank you, Dominique. Um, what I want to do before we turn it over to um, Vim, um, Vinenberg from PAX is to remind all of our um, participants, attendees, to put any questions you may have in the Q&A because we will start to pull them together for when we um, finish the panel discussion today. Um, Vim, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And first of all, a warm thank you to the uh, missions of Belgium, Costa Rica, Niger, Switzerland, and Vietnam, as well as UNEP, OCHA, and uh, Environmental Peacebuilding Association for uh, co-sponsoring uh, this event. As a peace organization working in conflict affected areas uh, with our partners, PACS have been working for nearly a decade now to raise the linkages between environment, peace, and security. From toxic munition remnants in Iraq to wide-scale deforestation and conflict-linked pollution in Syria, civilians and communities are facing multiple acute and long-term threats from uh, targeting of industrial facilities, the loss of agricultural land, uh, polluting coping mechanisms, affected water sources, and the long and the long-term absence of governance able to address these uh, also climate-related challenges. And with new research methods uh, using Earth observation from many new satellite constellations, open source investigations, and a wealth of remote sensing data and public reporting, we're now able better to explore the environmental impacts in almost near real time and on the more granular level, which also helps understanding the breadth and depth of the environmental security risk we're talking about today. So how do the environmental security, environmental dimensions of armed conflict link with protection of civilians? In my presentation, I want to briefly put on spotlight three key areas, a link protection of civilians with protection of the environment. And we will end with some thoughts on how, how the UN and in particular UN Security Council and member states can move this topic forward. Uh, next slide, please. The first topic would be looking at the use of explosive weapons in populated areas and the impact on civilian, civilians, which is gaining more momentum as part of our work on this topic. Uh, PACS have been doing research on the environmental harm associated with these issues in various reports on Syria and Iraq uh, starting in 2015 until uh, this year. And I will briefly walk through the main issues linking the explosive weapons, environmental harm and protection of civilians, looking at uh, direct and indirect impacts based on current cases. Next slide, please. In, for example, this is the case we're looking at here is the Mosul operation. In Mosul in 2016, after ISIS uh, took over the city in 2014 and the, uh, the US-led coalition together with the Iraqi army um, made it, uh, retook the city in 2016-2017, uh, uh, there was an anticipation that it would also create a lot of damage to the urban settings and with that also associated environmental risk. What we did there was combining various layers of urban settings, a look at industrial risk sites, and using a tool which was developed for humanitarian disasters, uh, the uh, flash environmental assessment tool, uh, to identify what the most environment, potential environmental hotspots were. And here you see an example uh, of this site, which was uh, developed in collaboration with UNEP and UN Habitat and the UN Environment Unit, uh, which would help uh, identify damage and first response where needed and in the long term where there could be potential ris uh, risks. So acute exposure risk from hazardous chemicals, for example, from numerous of uh, from various bombed industrial sites in Mosul, uh, PCB contamination from electricity grid. But also we're looking at, uh, in for example, in the case of Mosul, with millions of tons of rubble, which is often mixed with toxic substances such as asbestos, heavy metals, and various types of waste, which are piling up in urban areas. And lastly, there's also damage to the uh, wash, um, the water, sanitation, and health infrastructure, which are compo compounding environmental health risk uh, from uh, damage to urban areas uh, because of uh, waterborne diseases and communicable diseases. Next slide, please. On the long term, we're also looking at the wider impacts of rebuilding a city. So, for example, here we're looking at um, 
uh, quarries at the uh, Euphrates River, which are uh, unregulated. Uh, and there's a lot of, at the moment, they're dealing with a lot of problems around um, the use of uh, sand for reconstruction material, but also the safe uh, disposal and transport of the rubble in most of itself is an issue. Uh, there is uh, overuse of, uh, or the unregulated use is also impacting the, the river flow, the river dimensions, and nearby agricultural land, which was clearly outlined by amazing work uh, done by the UN Environment Programme on Iraq. And also what we've seen from previous conflicts, which were also um, analyzed by UN Environment post-conflict environmental assessments, that there was depletion of groundwater sources from stone quarrying uh, which also uh, resulted in the abandonment of complete villages as they couldn't access groundwater anymore uh, because the quarrying was used for uh, reconstruction materials in post-conflict settings after the, for example, the crisis in uh, the war in Lebanon in 2008. Next slide, please. The other aspect I want to focus on is looking at food security and damage to environmental infrastructure. Over the course of the last uh, decades, we've seen also how uh, deliberate attacks on um, agricultural areas are impacting food security. Uh, for example, in Syria, um, both government state actors and non-state actors uh, set fire to agriculture areas by deliberately using uh, either incendiary weapons uh, or um, arson techniques to burn down crops during the harvest season, which limited access to um, to uh, food for civilians, but also to livelihoods from many farmers depending on it. We've also seen here the linkages with the increased climate crisis. For example, in Syria, both in Syria and Iraq, but also in areas uh, in, in Yemen, uh, increased droughts or um, uh, 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 rain, heavy rains in the winter can speed up um, uh, growth of uh, weeds, which are more, and the, followed by heat season and could result in easily um, Sparks, when sparks would easily set fire to large uh, swaths of agricultural land, in particular when there's also a deliberate uh, attempt to burn down the forest, uh, current uh, and uh, resulting also in, in wildfires. In Syria, we see rapidly spreading wildfires in forest areas as well because of the absence of environmental uh, governance. There's not uh, sufficient materials or training of uh, bark of forest rangers to deal with that. And we also see the overuse of uh, natural resources, for example, from uh, water, uh, use of groundwater uh, for agriculture, and the use of, uh, of cutting down trees because fuel prices are going up and re resulting in more deforestation, and particularly in Syria, which will, Pax will be uh, publishing a forthcoming report on that uh, later this year. Next slide, please. And here are uh, two results, uh, two uh, uh, examples of uh, what's earlier mentioned by previous speakers on how to monitor that. So here for, is an example from Syria where we use remote sensing with uh, European Space Agency satellite uh, systems, uh, Sentinel-2 and uh, optical imagery and doing a long-term trend analysis on the burned areas in 2020. So helping to understand like where the areas here and here uh, you see, for example, on the front line between the Syrian Democratic Forces and the uh, area controlled by uh, the Syrian National Army, which is an armed group supported by Turkey, where repeated uh, shelling uh, caused a lot of crop fires in, um, in um, June and July of 2020, directly linked with the conflict. Next slide, please. And here's an example of burned areas from military operations against the Kurdish armed groups in Northern Iraq, uh, where uh, also again bombing uh, in these areas also resulted in a lot of wildfires and driving people from their homes and destroying uh, their forest in that area and affecting livestock and livelihoods. Next slide, please. Uh, it's already been touched on by the previous speaker, but also we are looking at conflict and water security and protection of civilians. So we've seen also in, um, in various uh, conflicts the, the, the deliberate targeting of uh, water infrastructure uh, for example, in Ukraine, uh, damage to water pipelines often result in millions of people with, uh, going without access to clean drinking water. In Syria, we've seen how uh, pollution of water sources, for example, from uh, uh, continuous oil spills because the oil industry has been severely affected and uh, there is no, uh, at the moment, no um, remediation or restoration efforts going on. 
and continuous spills are polluting uh, surface and groundwater, making it also difficult to use that for, uh, um, for drinking and for irrigation. And we've seen water being used as a weapon of war in post-conflict zones, for example, by cutting off access to water, which happened frequently last year, more than over 20 times where uh, water distribution was prevented um, and that impacted more than uh, close to uh, 500 or 600,000 people in Northeast Syria. And lastly, also the preventing of downstream water flows. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an example from uh, this year where there were concerns uh, that less rainfall uh, that was happening in the in uh, Turkey and uh, and the uh, Euphrates catchments uh, was also leading to less water flows into the Euphrates River, um, in particular in the southern Turkey where there is an intense um, use of water for uh, irrigation and agriculture, and uh, which was already and Turkey was already facing a drought the water was being kept into the reservoir, uh, resulting in less water going down to Syria, where also the dropping water levels were raising concern among Syrian farmers and communities. And here's an example where also we used remote sensing to monitor what was going on in that area in terms of water and access to water and water security. So demonstrating just more that new techniques can be helpful. And uh, next slide, please. So um, lastly, um, and I'll end with this slide, um, we've seen that environment, peace and security has recently emerged as a priority issue in, on the international agenda, uh, including a reporting by the UN Secretary General on the protection of civilians, which was mentioned earlier, and the UN Security Council discussions, uh, for example, on the FSO Safar tanker in Yemen and UN Security Council resolutions on the objects indispensable, uh, targeting of objects indispensable for the survival of the civilian populations, but also in other UN fora, for example, resolutions in the UN Environment Assembly on conflict pollution and protection of the environment and by the International Law Committee's work and of course the ICRC's updated military guidelines. So what more can now be done to take this forward? Here we have some uh, ideas of what I think uh, states and international organizations could do, and some of them already mentioned earlier. So we've noticed that anal analysis and information sharing on conflict-linked environmental issues must be improved across the UN system uh, and can be used also to strengthen humanitarian response work. By having that data, by sharing the data, we understand better and faster what issues are and can respond to it more efficiently. Second, the UN Security Council should call on the UN Secretariat to provide regular briefings uh, on security implications for environmental risk, uh, including national regional assessments uh, where possible and relevant. Uh, this also links better with the UN, with the UN uh, climate security discussions where there's some overlap. Uh, third, uh, parties to the conflict have a direct responsibility to take measures possible for prevention, including implementations of their guidelines, the ICOC, uh, ILC draft principles, international and practice, but also in supporting and funding work by international organizations um, to uh, assess and respond to uh, environmental degradation. And lastly, we believe the state should explore an overarching umbrella across the UN system on environment, peace and security that brings together information, analysis and expertise on conflict, environmental relation and climate change. And here we see that the link, we uh, see the linkages, uh, but also the distinction with the climate security debate, but we've seen also how the data information collection and sharing uh, on the environmental degradation and impact on people uh, is an overlap which can be explored, but also responses on remediation and restoration processes should be developed, financed and implemented by states or through international organizations. And I think that's a, a really good momentum to go forward to build an inclusive and a coherent approach where international policymakers, uh, experts, representatives from effective communities are uh, brought together to find a meaningful solutions in practice and policy on environment, peace and security. And we hope today could be a, a next starting a, a set off of that discussion. And we're looking forward to future opportunities to explore this with states. Thank you. Thank you, Vim. And also I should say thank you, Dominique, for bringing in examples um, from the Middle East. Um, and I just wanna thank all of our panelists for such rich presentations and also really highlighting how the field has 
really grown and developed over the last decade where, you know, early, you know, you'd wait for a post-conflict environmental assessment to take place to begin to understand um, what, you know, um, what had happened to the environment during war. And what we're hearing today are there are all these different new tools, technologies, remote sensing that can be used to have a better sense of, um, you know, what it means to damage the environment for civilians. Um, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done to understand where we started with what it means for long-term human health when the environment is destroyed and for livelihoods. But these um, presentations today really help us tease out a whole array of mechanisms uh, between you know, protecting the environment and protecting civilians and also highlighting many of the legal tools that exist through international humanitarian law or mechanisms for building resilience. Um, into programming both in the humanitarian sector and the development sector. Um, at this point, we are going to have a few um, responses um, and to these presentations before we open it up for the formal Q&A. And I'd like to first turn um, the, the screen, the floor, over to um, Mr. Adrian Howery. Um, from the mission um, of Switzerland, who will have will say a few share a few remarks with us. Thank you very much, Erica and uh, Excellencies, dear colleagues. It is a great honor to co-sponsor today's side event. I'm very grateful to take the floor for Switzerland as a co-host of the event, and I thank the other organizers for their efforts and the panelists for making themselves available today and for those very impressive uh, presentations and interesting remarks. Um, during the POC week in spring last year, uh, we have already discussed the protection of the environment at the side events. We have come a long way since then. The Security Council has taken up the topic several times and it discussed humanitarian effects of environmental degradation in September contemporary drivers of conflict in November and climate and security in July as well as last February. In several resolutions, namely 2349 on Lake Chad, the council addressed the interlinkages between climate change, ecological, ecological changes and stability. The recent deployment of a climate and security advisor within the UN assistance mission in Somalia could serve as an example on how to concretely address issues of climate and security in mission mandates. The group of friends on climate and security of which Switzerland is an active member is contributing valuable work on the subject. The creation of the informal expert group of members of the Security Council on climate change and security is, an important, uh, is important to address the topic in a more coherent way across the agenda of the Council. There are all in all strong signals that the challenge at hand has gained traction. It is now important that we keep up the pace and continue to explore what changes are needed to render civilians safer while addressing environmental degradation and the effects of climate change. I, I would like to make three points today, if you allow. First, environmental degradation can be a root cause and a consequence of conflict. Climate change and armed conflict and environmental degradation create a mutually reinforcing negative spiral, threatening the safety and security of the affected communities. It can also prolong ongoing conflicts and thus not only increase the costs on civilians and civilian infrastructure, but also threaten peace and development efforts in the longer run. Second, as a chair of the Group of Friends on the Protection of Civilians, Switzerland encourages the Security Council to consistently integrate the protection of the environment and climate change in its deliberations and decisions. As the Secretary General describes in his 2021 report on the protection of civilians, environmental degradation, climate change and armed conflicts are closely linked to the disadvantage of civilians. We should foster debates on these issues. The group of friends on the protection of civilians, for example, has already discussed these challenges in a meeting in November 2020. 
Third, strictly respecting international humanitarian law, notably the rules that provide protection to the natural environment is key to limit environmental damage during armed conflict. In 2020, the International Committee of Directors, the ICRC, updated its guidelines on the protection of the natural environment and armed conflict, as we just heard and were presented by Chris Harland in the last in intervention. The guidelines provide a very useful overview on how rules of international humanitarian law protect the natural environment, and they include recommendations for their implementation and interpretation. Switzerland calls on all member states to consider these guidelines as a useful tool for civilian and military actors. And finally, I would like to address three questions to the distinguished panelists, which could nourish the discussion. First, how can we further raise awareness and promote dialogue within the UN system, including with the Security Council on the interlinkages between the protection of the environment as well as climate change and the protection of civilians? And second, environmental degradation and climate change worsens, among others, food insecurity, especially combined with COVID-19. How can these effects be mitigated? How can the different impacts of these efforts on men and women be clearly identified and effectively addressed. And third, prevention is crucial. How could more effective early warning and early action schemes be developed? I thank you very much. And I give the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you. I am now gonna ask um, for some comments from um, Ambassador Maritza um, Chan Barat um, Valverde, um, the Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative of the Mission of Costa Rica to the UN. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Costa Rica is honored to join forces with the organizers of this event, and we'd like to thank the panelists for the insightful presentations. Costa Rica is convinced that the protection of the environment during armed conflict is protection of civilians. We also recognize, recognize the nexus between the environment, peace, and security. From civil wars to military coups and interstate conflicts, civilians remain trapped in the crossfire and it's never too early to take decisive action. Costa Rica is eager to advance the civilian protection agenda that is comprehensive and to par with the conflicts of this day and age. In this regard, we would like to stress three points. First, Costa Rica stresses that situating the protection of civilians in a human security effort will yield the most effective results. Protection of civilians by definition must include comprehensive protection of human security before, during, and after conflict. In other words, we consider that the POC agenda does not just apply to warfare. It applies every time that we avert our eyes from the human security of our citizens and the citizens of other states. Civilians are civilians everywhere. They must be protected across the spectrum for war to peace and in every facet of the human experience. Second, and with that in mind, Costa Rica joins your call in considering environmental degradation as a central consideration of the protection of civilians agenda. War and conflict inflict tremendous damage on the environment. This comes at great expense to civilian health, livelihoods and cultural heritage, as we have heard today. Food security is also particularly impeded by warfare with the toxic and chemical substances by products conflict literally poisoning local soil and water sources and putting, and putting communities at grave risk. Disturbingly, the intentional deprivation and or interferes with essential natural resources such as water sources is increasingly and Ill illegally being used as a weapon of war. Peace and environmental justice exist in lockstep and our civilian protection agenda must reflect this. Last, Costa Rica urges our community of nations to consider protection of civilians through the widest possible lens. We must be bold and broad when it comes to protecting civilians. 
When we say we the people of the United Nations, we do not speak of states, but of civilians. We must not forget that many civilians go to sleep every night, wondering if a coup, an illegal annexation, or a deficient regulation mechanism for the transfer of conventional weapons will prevent them from seeing the next state. Costa Rica maintains that decades from now, we must not look back at this year, at this meeting, and lament if we only had done more. Let's lead by example. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chen. Um, I am going to um, let our panelists respond to the questions that were posed by um, Mr. Howie from the Mission of Switzerland. If, if anyone would like to respond to the three questions that were raised first before we open it up for some broader questions. Erica, I'd, I'd be happy to take on a quest, the, the question about raising further awareness. Uh, and I think, I think it's, it's essentially about the costs of responding to weak um, wash systems or weak, weak water and sanitation systems. So if, if the job of development and, and governments isn't done well uh, prior to these crises, the costs are going to be uh, much, much higher. We need to get a better handle on those costs. They're not easy things to, to measure. But we know that the humanitarian uh, costs of um, support are, are increasing all the time. And so I think that that would be the, the route, take this financial angle on it. Back to you. Great. Um, is there anyone else who wants to respond? Or I can um, let you ponder and yes, Vim. Yeah, there was one question on um, the master military doctrine and uh, reverberating effects. Um, oh, okay. There was, I think there is now the, the current discussion on the political declaration on the use of explosive weapons in populated areas is an important step forward on uh, addressing these risks from um, reverberating effects of explosive weapons. Um, which also includes, uh, which is raised during discussion to look at environmental harm uh, into that uh, into that uh, statement and uh, political declaration. And at the same time, we also see the NATO's handbook on protection of civilians. There is more information now on the environmental impact assessments of military operations that should be included in the planning, uh, both in the targeting, but also in the footprint of operations themselves. And of, certainly there's more room for improvement for states, uh, for armed forces to uh, look at the uh, environmental footprint and look at the environmental effects of, the, uh, of targeting decisions. So we also encourage armed forces to, um, to look at the uh, ICRC guidelines, uh, but also um, yeah, they always can be, of course, be more progressive and, and look further uh, if they uh, please to do so. So I think there's definitely room for improvement there. And thanks for raising this question. Great. Um, I am going to start with some of the questions that have jumped in. And if anyone else wants to respond to the um, prior questions, feel free to, too. Um, but we only have, you know, um, about five, 10 minutes left. So we have a question from um, Marike Kremen from the Global um, Fund for Widows. And she asks, I would like to know if the panelists and their organizations have collected gender disaggregated data. And if they could, um, if you could please um, speak more towards that data and how the impacts of the dest destruction of the environment and conflict manifest themselves in gender dimensions. So we haven't heard much about um, issue of um, you know, gender um, when it comes to protecting the environment. And then um, we have another question um, from Thomas Ritzer. Um, directed towards Mr. Harland, um, and he asks, can you provide examples where parties to a conflict agreed on designating demilitarized zones to protect the environment? Have such specific environment-related agreements been a, um, effective entry points for broader mediation and conflict resolution processes? And then um, one last question, then I will um, maybe go in the order of um, the presentations today. 
for responses. Um, and um, this question um, is from Ezekiel Hefes from Geneva Call, um, which is a humanitarian NGO that engages um, with non-state armed groups on various thematic issues. And he asks um, a question regarding non-state armed groups, um, particularly whether the panelists' views on how to increase the interest of non-state armed groups um, on the protection of the environment, given that they are also our key players. So we haven't heard much to, about um, engaging non-state armed groups in protecting the environment. Um, so how about we just go through the order of the presentations today and we can start um, with Johanna, if that's okay. Hi, um, I can only answer to the limit of um, our study, um, but with regard to the question on gender disagreed data that was definitely a topic that our interviewees and surveyed um surveyed practitioners underlined saying which is also what um, i said during the presentation understanding the gender nature of um, these environmental coping strategies but um, especially in the context of conflict and how this is interlinked with gender-based violence um, and they, um, our interviewees definitely highlighted the need to increase data and to share that data across different actors um, for it to be um, efficient in the protection of civilians, especially with regards to um, uh, women. Great. Um, Chris? Yes, thank you very much. Um, maybe just to touch on a, on a few elements in the questions, and thank you very much for those. There are some very good questions there. Um, I, I don't have um, disaggregated uh, data relating to women in particular, but I would highlight um, two um, uh, you know, documents that we used in uh, our work relating to the guidelines. Um, one of those was findings relating to the effect of the destruction of uh, electrical and water supplies in Yemen and the effect that that had on pregnant women. Um, and that's included in the study. I can, I'll, I'll post the, um, uh, the reference to it. And secondly, um, the, the use of Agent Orange in uh, Southeast Asia had also a number of effects on women in particular and on uh, reproduction. And, uh, and again, I'd, I'd mention, I'll put that, uh, a link to that uh, as well. Um, secondly, uh, on the question relating to demilitarized zones, um, I don't know of one that is both environment and demilitarized. There are many examples in armed conflict of the parties agreeing to zones which they consider to be off limits. Um, and there are many zones that are now being declared demilitarized, the Åland Islands, for example, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, and uh, Antarctica are two of the areas, but there are many others. And I think what's really interesting is that a little bit like cultural property, where states declare certain objects off limit from war because of the importance in keeping it for the, the essentially the cultural heritage of mankind. Um, but you could do something similar with the environment and say these areas, because of their environmental importance, even before an armed conflict begins, you do that. And I know, for example, uh, NATO has um, started to explore that a little bit um, as well and has standing rules relating to it. Um, maybe on the question of um, uh, that was asked about reverberating effects, um, I think there's a lot more work um, uh, that's yet to be done. Um, what I'm told by some militaries um, is that they do take into account the effects on the civilian population, but maybe they don't do it in a systematic way. So they'll look at, for example, the likely number of civilian casualties and uh, deaths to civilians. I've even seen circumstances where they put a dollar value or a, a name your currency value on an object in armed conflict because they know they might have to rebuild it after the armed conflict ends. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of work to do on it, but I, I, I might take a little bit of issue with that. I think states do it. I think armed forces do it, but they maybe don't do it in a systematic way. Um, and that's maybe where a lot of work um, that could be done. And we recommend, for example, having engineers on board, knowing um, what the effects might be of a particular attack. And finally, um, we have Geneva Call asking a question where I would throw it back to them because they're, 
Uh, of course, we spend a lot of time in the Conseil Armed Groups as well. Um, but I think that's that's a really good discussion. I would say that that wouldn't uh, currently the environment is not our primary concern when we start to non-state armed groups about um, respecting the laws of war. It's don't attack civilians, number one. Um, but I think there's maybe room to have a discussion, especially if you're dealing with a group that you've had a little bit more time and exposure to. So sorry, I've taken a lot of time, but uh, those are some initial reactions. Uh, thanks. No, all great points, um, Dominique. Yeah. Thanks. Um, on the gender disaggregated data, there are two points. I have a general point and a sort of very technical point. The general point is um, that, uh, particularly around uh, through the, throughout the Middle East, um, except with the exception of a couple of countries, there really is a paucity of household survey data. So this is the, the, the sort of large scale household survey data that would be coll collected for uh, GDP calculations or simply as part of something like the multiple indicator cluster survey or the, the, uh, the demographic and health surveys. So the frequency of these surveys in the Middle East is much lower than in other parts of the world. And if we want to track these types of uh, question, they, they would they really need to be, uh, there needs to be more investment um, in those. And, and I think that they would really, it would be well worthwhile. The very technical question, uh, point that I have on this is that where some of these questions are being fielded or questionnaires, uh, surveys are being fielded, they're missing specific questions which are common in other parts of the world, say on uh, which member of the family is, is actually fetching water. And so we, there's also a quality control issue. So broad point, the more surveys, more household surveys, uh, but also keep the quality up. Back to you. Lastly, Vim, if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah, I think on the on the gender aggregated data, um, PAXA at the moment is doing human security surveys in both uh, South Sudan and Iraq, uh, broadly looking at human security issues there. And recently we also included an, an environmental component, so uh, asking also environmental data and also seg um, uh, segregated by, uh, by uh, gender. Um, so we are also getting more information and the results we're now seeing are already interesting and the perception of environmental and uh, climate related security risk in the answers. So we're starting to doing that uh, and I think there's definitely room for more improvement uh, to do that also in, in, in conflict zones, uh, although we're limited there in terms of access um, to, uh, to, for example, for surveys and also the information, especially for the remote sensing data, it's, well, it's obviously difficult to look at those kind of dimensions. Um, so uh, on that, on, on that, on non-state armed groups, it's also interesting. We're currently also finishing a report on pollution in northeast Syria, which is currently controlled by the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a non-state armed group, um, also struggling with a lot of environmental issues uh, in that area. Um, but there, there also we see like a difficulty uh, with force non-state armed groups to deal with the kind of issues because of the political situation and their non-acceptance as an entity makes it also difficult to provide um, a response uh, or funding or uh, material, uh, construction materials or expertise to that group to deal with, for example, the oil pollution uh, because of uh, pressure from other countries uh, around North East Syria that don't, don't agree with and putting pressure on donors not to support materials sustaining the environmental uh, pollution in that area. So uh, therefore there's a willingness among those groups to deal with environmental issues. Um, but uh, also the, the political situation there makes it difficult for them to uh, get access to materials and funding to actually do that. So that's a key issue. What they are open to discussion and I, I hope that also they will find a solution soon to resolve those kind of uh, uh, problems there. So it's definitely something we should uh, encourage more to talk about with uh, non state armed groups. I'm muted. Um, I know we're getting close to um, wrapping up and turning over to um, Ambassador Kridelka for some final comments. Um, we've had a few additional questions come in um, and you know they're related to early warning mechanisms. Um, there was one on, um, again, Western military doctrine and reverberating effects, which they're in the chat as well as I probably in the Q&A at this point. Um, 
I'm going to give one more round if there's any last concluding remarks that any of you want to make before we um, turn it over um, for our, our um, final remarks. And how about we go backwards this time and we'll start with Vim. And also feel free to answer additional questions in the chat for um, you know, participants. Um, yeah, just a quick response to the uh, question on early warning. I think um, uh, data is very important here. We have the tools, we have the means we've demonstrated over the last five, six years that we can uh, rapidly collect data on issues. It's not complete. Uh, there are always limitations to remote sensing data, um, but uh, we also see from internal organizations, they're incorporating that, for example, in initiatives which, uh, which reach an impact initiatives or in, uh, doing this in their work. And the joint environment unit is doing great work, which would uh, support would uh, need more support, I think, from states, and in particular in terms of funding. And they can expand also work on particular and conflict-linked risks. So I would definitely uh, say that as an uh, um, as a uh, recommendation and, and as an example where this can be done. And I think the examples I gave from the presentation also demonstrated that. I'll leave it at that. So I, I think I'm next, right? Yeah, um, sorry. So very much support that film. Uh, really, I think we need to get much better at reading the signs um, of potential problems down the road. Um, and, and so collecting early early warning data is, is really essential. And we, we need to do that collaboratively because the cost of doing it individually is really high. Chris, final thoughts? Thank you. Just uh, maybe to highlight uh, two things. Uh, one is, again, to encourage states to fund those that are interested in uh, protecting the environment and on conflict, uh, to fund studies, analysis of the effects uh, of armed conflict on the environment. That leads to the cycle of understanding better, which leads to uh, being able to make arguments on foreseeability. And with foreseeability arguments, you can then convince military commanders um, uh, about um, you know, bearing things in mind and changing your, your course of action based on what's happened. And it's, it's why we've had uh, weapons restrictions and prohibitions. It's seeing the effects of things. And it's through data analysis research that we get that. So we just really encourage states to continue to support that. And secondly, just to pass the key message again, protection, of the environment is protection of civilians. Thanks. Thank you for emphasizing that one more time. Um, Johanna. Yeah, um, thank you again. And to emphasize everything that the other panelists have said. And um, I think, especially um, from a research point of view, I think discussions like these are really important, which have different people from different fields. And that it really underlines the increased cooperation and collaboration that is needed to make the environment visible in protection of civilians. So thank you again. Um, thank you to all the panelists again. Um, and Mike, you know, one of the key messages, data, data, data. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over for some final remarks um, from um, Ambassador Philippe um, Credel Credelka from the Mission of Belgium. And, um, oh, there you are. So I'm gonna let, let you Thank begin. you, Professor Weintal. Thank you very much. And I wanted just to say that this sort of exchange of ideas reminds me of the best moments I keep from my short experience in the Security Council, you know, that Belgium sat there in 2019, 2020. They were actually the exchanges with civil society practitioners and academics in the margins of discussions in the, in the, in the council. I, I, I did learn a lot in those discussions, for instance, on children and armed conflicts or uh, climate related topics. And this reminded me very much of that. Uh, thank you very much for the quality of the exchanges. And first of all, I would like to thank warmly our co-hosts, Costa Rica, Niger, Switzerland, and Vietnam, as well as PAX and PAX and the Joint UNEP OCHA Environment Unit for the organization of this event. It has been a honor, um, all of us, to listen today to the highly qualified experts in the panel. And I also want to thank you, uh, Professor Weintal, the moderator, for ensuring a smooth run of show today. You did it very well, thank you. Many of the examples given today, my dear colleagues, 
demonstrate that the most vulnerable to the environmental impact of conflict are the ones whose resilience to cope with these changes is already put to test by other shocks. And indeed, the environmental impact of conflict, as well as climate change, reinforce existing social, political, economic, or environmental drivers of conflict and aggravate existing vulnerabilities and inequalities. Even then, the vulnerabilities of people and countries in conflict or with internal fragility are not sufficiently taken into account in the climate financing framework. The countries that most need climate finance are least likely to receive it. That is why, if you forgive me to give a little national touch to it, my country, Belgium, focuses its climate financing of around 120 million US dollars per year on the least developed countries, the LDCs. And it is also why the vast majority of the activities of the Belgian Development Agency, ENABEL, are executed in fragile contexts, the Sahel, for instance. To further strengthen our engagement, we are making our development activities more climate sensitive, uh, where we are working, Palestine, Central Africa, and as I said, in the Sahel. I'm happy that today's event drew attention to the protection and humanitarian angle of these challenges. This is in line with a high level event that we have organized together with Niger again, the European Union delegation in New York and as IICRC during the General Assembly last year. This protection angle is important for us for two reasons, mainly firstly, because the environment is often an overlooked casualty of conflict as highlighted today many times. The examples are numerous, direct damages from conflict result in widespread toxic remnants of war that pose acute health risk to civilians or damaged and affected infrastructure or agricultural areas pose additional risks to water and food security. And the second reason is that it has become increasingly clear that we need to strengthen the environmental dimension of humanitarian and development work the critical dimension of the triple nexus approach is to ensure that climate change as well as conflict linked environmental degradation are integrated into programming. We need more adaptable, localized, flexible and innovative programs in fragile settings that focus on strengthening resilience of vulnerable communities. And in conclusions, my dear colleague, I'd like to thank you all once again for the fruitful discussions and one more time, as we now all know, protection of the environment is protection of civilians. Thank you very much. And with that, um, we conclude this event on the protection of the environment, protection of civilians. And I again want to thank our co-hosts for this event, the governments of Belgium, Costa Rica, Niger, Switzerland, and Vietnam as well as UNEP OSHA Environment Unit, um, Environmental Peace Building Association, Association and PACS. And thank you for everyone for attending.